All right, guys. So today I want to talk about acoustics. Okay, so I don't have a ton of time today, but that's okay because we were already scheduled to do a shorty video today anyway. So what I wanted to do today is just do a really simple, really quick lecture on the basics of acoustics. Okay, so first of all, we talk about coverage with acoustics. So coverage is basically how much you treat the room with your acoustic treatment, how much of the room is covered. So usually when we're talking about this coverage, we'll say that in order to deaden a room, you gotta do at least 50 to 75% coverage. So that means that 50 to 75% of like the walls, the ceiling, the floor are gonna be covered with some kind of acoustic treatment. So for example, vocal isolation booths tend to be very dead. They don't have a ton of natural reverb, right? And so that's because vocal isolation booths tend to have about 75% or more sometimes of coverage with acoustic treatment. And sometimes it's a little less and sometimes it's a little more. It kind of just depends on how you want the sound to be for your space. So just on a side note, whenever I'm talking about a room sounding more dead or more live, that's just talking about how much natural reverb the room has. So when a room has more of that natural reverb, so when you make noise in a room, you hear more of that sound bouncing back towards you, that's going to sound more live. That's what we call a more live room. And so a good example of a room that would be more dead is like an isolation booth or something that has a ton of treatment in it. And when you make a noise in it, you don't hear a ton of that noise bouncing back at you. So I guess like an example of a room that would be completely dead is an anechoic chamber, right? And so part of how you treat a room, an acoustic space, will depend on the type of application you want to use it for, right? Because if we're doing something like instructional videos, spoken word recordings, podcasts, audiobooks, those things all tend to require or we tend to want a room that's more dead sounding. Whereas if we're setting up a drum set and we're doing a recording, we might want a little more of the room. We might want it to sound more live, right? So it totally depends on what type of thing you're going to be doing in that room. So basically the way that I break it down to clients that want me to help them with their acoustics is I say that there are three main components to acoustic treatment. And so this is within an existing room, right? So if you're building a room from scratch, uh, from the ground up, then there are gonna be other things to consider. So this is within an existing room where you can't change the actual room, the actual structure, the existing architecture, right? So before I go over these three things, I just wanna tell you guys that I actually have a sheet that I give to clients that are interested in having me help them with their acoustics. And I pair this sheet with my quote and basically what it does is it educates them about the basics of acoustics so they can kind of understand the value behind each of these components when I then recommend what they should buy, what they should have me install. So I'm actually going to make this sheet available to my Patreon patrons. So I'm going to take this sheet and I actually added some notes for you guys specifically. And I'm going to make that available to my Patreon patrons on patreon.com. So if you're interested in getting this, if you're interested in supporting the channel directly, it's going to be patreon.com slash Cato Noise. Okay, and the first thing is absorption. And this is the thing that's usually not forgotten about. It's usually the thing that's treated first. It's usually the thing that I would say like a layman on the street would notice first about a space. And so basically what absorption does is it helps us avoid flutter echo in a room and it helps us absorb those. It's going to be mostly high frequencies that will bounce around in a room. So when you clap and you hear all those high frequencies bouncing around in a room, absorption is one of the things that's going to help that the most. So another way of wording it is that absorption just helps us tame the room's natural reverb. So the way we treat a space with absorption is we'll take absorptive materials and we'll put them usually on the walls, but sometimes on the ceilings too just anywhere that you can place an absorptive material really and so a lot of times what we're choosing for that absorptive material is something like an acoustic foam right so if you ever see these these are pretty common in sound studio something that looks like that it's just a frame that has some foam in the middle and that's what's counting as our absorption sometimes people will see Sometimes we'll see something like this where it's little foam squares that have bumps in them, kind of like an egg carton, but it's not egg cartons. It's made out of foam. And so there's a lot of acoustic foam out there that looks like that. But basically we're taking something absorptive and we're putting it on the walls, on the ceiling, wherever you want to put it. And you don't have to use acoustic foam. Acoustic foam is kind of like the higher end for this type of thing. You can also use insulation. People have had good results building their own frames and then putting insulation in the frames instead of the foam inside the frame. And people have also used things like thick blankets or thick rugs and hung them on their walls or on their ceilings. So that's also something you can use for absorption. But basically absorption is one of the things to keep in 
in mind for acoustics. And just in general, what we want to do with absorption is a lot of times our focus is going to be on putting that absorption on parallel walls, so walls that are actually parallel to each other. And we do that because it can help reduce flutter echo, but also when walls are parallel to each other, there are certain frequencies. If their wavelengths are matching the length of the room, the distance between the two parallel walls, then certain frequencies, those frequencies, are going to either augment themselves or cancel themselves out to some capacity. So we end up losing or augmenting, basically not getting a balanced frequency spectrum in that room. So that's why we tend to focus on parallel walls a lot of times with acoustic treatment. Okay, so the second thing out of three that I tend to tell clients to focus on is diffusion. So, so these are actually really good examples visually to get the idea of what we're talking about. But basically with diffusion, a lot of times we'll hang something like this on the wall. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll put it on the wall that's behind where the engineer is sitting if it's in something like the mixing room or the control room. So on the most basic level, the diffuser is actually making it so that it's breaking up those parallel walls, right? So these are all different lengths, these little chunks of wood. And so it's making it so that the distance from parallel wall to parallel wall is going to vary slightly as you go across the room. So that helps prevent those frequencies from either augmenting themselves or canceling themselves out. So it's basically, in a way, it's breaking up that parallel wall pattern a little bit. So it helps us even out that frequency spectrum a little bit in that sense. And it also helps us do that without getting rid of our acoustic energy, right? Because we have the absorption panels that are made of something like foam, and those kind of deaden that acoustic energy because they're absorbing those higher frequencies. Whereas this kind of thing is bouncing frequencies around. It's just kind of controlling how you're bouncing them around. So if you're struggling to keep your space sounding live and not sounding as dead, you can use something like a diffuser to help control and even out your frequency spectrum, control the room a little bit without deadening the room. But then, you know, if you're doing something like a podcast or spoken word thing where you want the room to be totally dead, I would probably just skip this and just, you know, treat with nothing but absorption and the next thing that we're going to talk about. And that's just because we want it totally dead, right? So we want to absorb all the sound. And that's why a lot of smaller vocal booths, since they tend to be used for that kind of a purpose, they tend to be treated with a ton of absorption instead of something like this. Okay, so now we get to our final thing, which is bass traps. So bass traps are the type of thing for acoustics that beginners, when they're building their own studio at home maybe, or someone who's less experienced and is trying to treat a space acoustically, people will tend to skip bass traps, but it's so, so, so important. And that's because lower frequencies are really hard to control. So for example, with our absorption panels, they're usually made out of something like foam, and those usually are not dense enough to capture lower frequencies. So they're not dense enough to capture or control in any way the lower end of the frequency spectrum. So low frequencies tend to go through things, but sometimes they'll get caught up in denser materials. So for example, if you're looking at an existing room, you're not really sure what's in the walls there. And so sometimes there are materials in your actual walls that are dense enough to then capture the low frequencies and send them back into your room. So one of the issues that people tend to get a lot is low frequencies building up within the corners of their room. And so sometimes we call that bass buildup in a room. And if you have that, it can make your recording sound really boomy and gross. So it's just something that we want to avoid. It's not something that we want to forget about or ignore if we're trying to build a really nicely treated acoustic space. So bass traps are really important. So, you know, on a really basic level, we have our absorption panels and those treat the higher frequencies by capturing them and keeping the room from sounding too live. And then we have our bass traps, which are there to control the low end of the frequency spectrum. So one's kind of getting the higher end of the frequency spectrum, and one's getting the lower end of the frequency spectrum. And then we have diffusion there to kind of keep the sound bouncing around in a controlled way. So sometimes if I have a client that's looking to save money and perhaps also doing something where it doesn't have to be like a recording studio level of acoustic treatment, like if they're just recording podcasts or something like that, then I'll have them try out the absorptive materials first and then we'll see how it sounds and go from there. But I always make sure that they understand that bass traps are something that will improve their sound even if it's something that they then decide that it's okay to skip. So that's basically it for today. So in the actual sheet that's going to be available to my Patreon patrons, I talk a little bit more about how I then go about doing the quote for the client. And then I also talk about a few recommendations that I make if they're trying to cut costs. There are some things that are a lot cheaper to use than, for example, fancy studio foam. So I do have a few recommendations like that in the actual sheet that's going to be available to my Patreon patrons. So if you're a patron, uh, go check that out if it's something you're interested in.
Cool. So that's about all I have time for today. I hope you guys like this video. I hope you found it useful. Please let me know what you think. So as always, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And if you're interested in supporting my channel directly, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash Noise. I'll be coming out with new videos every Wednesday. And thanks for watching. Okay.